afternoon, everyone. My name is Mina Bose. I'm the Executive Dean for Public Policy and Public Service Programs and the Director for the Peter S. Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency in the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy, and International Affairs at Hofstra University. And it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you here today for our panel on evaluating the early Biden presidency. I'm gonna turn the microphone over to our university president in just a moment, but let me just take this second as people are coming in, I know we're showing pride passes to get in. Just what a joy it is to see so many students here. Um, I know this room is filling up quickly. We have four classes in attendance today. Special thanks to my American politics class. I see all of you. I hope you signed the <laughs> roster. Uh, this is true for all the classes. Um, Professor Schneerman's state and local politics class is here. Uh, Professor Fritz's international politics class is here, and Professor Feldman's American politics class is here. In addition, I know we have numerous other students and faculty. It is wonderful to see uh, my political science colleagues, Dr. Dudek, the chair of the Department of Political Science, Dr. Parati, who hosted a session in here earlier today with some of you, uh, Dr. Burnett, who also works in the dean's office, but is a political scientist by training. Um, and it is uh, especially wonderful today to have for our first Calico event with our new senior presidential fellows, our uh, acting dean for the Hofstra College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Dan Siebold, our acting provost, Janet Lenahan, our vice president for development, Alan Kelly, and, um, and to have all of you here in the audience with us. It is my distinct pleasure, I'll make formal introductions of our presidential fellows in a moment. Um, at this time, it is my great pleasure to welcome to the stage Hofstra's ninth university president, Susan Poser. Thank you, Mina. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Mr. Peter Calico this afternoon, and I want to welcome him uh, along with the Calico Center's senior presidential fellows and our distinguished guests, Phil Schirillo and Ari Fleischer. Um, so this is going to be a very abbreviated introduction. If I gave the full introduction of uh, Mr. Calico, that would pretty much take up the entire hour. So this is very abbreviated. Uh, Peter S. Calico is an alumnus of Hofstra University and the president of H.J. Calico & Company, one of New York City's leading real estate firms. He is the former chairman of the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, which you know is the MTA, uh, former commissioner of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, past owner and publisher of the New York Post, and current chairman of the Grand Central Partnership. Mr. Calico began his career in real estate in 1967 and became president of Calico and Company in 1973. He is the third generation to preside over his family's 95-year-old real estate company. As a leader in New York City real estate, Mr. Calico is an active participant in every major real estate association and ser serves as a governor of the Real Estate Board of New York. In addition to being a leader in New York real estate, Mr. Calico has a longstanding commitment to public service and has served in a number of important roles. As I mentioned, he served on the board and as chairman of the MTA and which is the state authority overseeing the operations, planning, and financing of metropolitan New York's subways, buses, commuter railroads, bridges, and tunnels. Mr. Calico is also involved in many philanthropic causes. He's a trustee of New York Presbyterian Hospital, and the Calicos have been recognized for their deep commitment to this institution with the Peter and Mary Calico Founders Lobby and the Peter and Mary Calico Pediatric Intensive Care Unit at New York Presbyterian. He is a founding trustee of the Museum of Jewish Heritage at Battery Park and has served on the board of the Jewish National Fund. He also serves as a trustee of Temple Emmanuel in New York City. He's a recipient of numerous awards and honors in recognition of his leadership in real estate and in public service. And I picked out just two to mention. One is the Peace Medal, which is Israel's highest civilian award and the Commandantori in the Order of Merit of the Italian Republic, one of the highest honors bestowed by the government of Italy. 
As I mentioned, Mr. Calico is a Hofstra alumnus and a member of the Board of Trustees of Hofstra University and was awarded an honorary doctorate of law in 1986. And in 1988, he received Hofstra's Alumni of the Year Award. In 2015, with a very generous gift, Mr. Calico established the Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy, and International Affairs uh, at Hofstra, which is, of course, hosting this event. And this built upon his support for the Calico Center for the Study of the American Presidency and the Calico Chair in Presidential Studies. This generos generosity and foresight have made Hofstra an international destination for those interested in studying and researching the American presidency, government, and public policy. And we are so grateful to Mr. Calico's continued loyalty to Hofstra and his interest in education. So it's a pleasure to see you again, Peter. It was wonderful to have some time to chat. Um, I congratulate you and thank you for all you have done and continue to do for Hofstra University. And um, I believe you want to make some remarks. Um, thank you, Susan. Uh, we have two Hofstra alumni sitting here, one at either end of the day, <laughs> which I'm proud to say. And every time I come to these events, I never cease to be amazed and awed by the quality of the students that we get at this school, by the questions they ask and what they, what they want to do. It, um, it's a great thing for me. I was always interested in politics. And I would say to, uh, to, to Mina, I could imagine what, at my school, if we were able to have Pierre Salinger, George Reedy, to come and give students a lecture about what was going on in government. So I'm happy to be here. I'm proud to be part of this. And thank you very much. And you guys do a good job. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for making this possible. It is so exciting to have speakers on campus again. We have a lot of rich topics to discuss. And um, before I begin, I just wanted to thank again President Poser for joining us today and for support of these key issues, complex questions in American politics, not easy to resolve, but certainly conversation is the I would say the first step toward doing so, and that's what we plan to engage today. I would also like to say, uh, give greatest thanks to the Hofstra Cultural Center, particularly Athleen Collins, who's slipping out right now, uh, Carol Vallison, she doesn't want to hear me say this, uh, Janine Rinaldi, for putting together everything from our backdrop to making the rain stop. Athleen, I don't know how you did it, but thank you. <laughs> and many thanks also to our Office of University Relations, Melissa Connolly, Ginny Greenberg, Carla Schuster, and so many others who've uh, made everything possible today. Let me now, without, uh, although there's much I would like to say about our fellows program, um, let me focus on our, uh, on our two distinguished speakers that we're so delighted to have with us today. The Calico Senior Presidential Fellows Program actually started in 2009. After the 2008 election, Peter Calico spoke with uh, the university about bringing together policy practitioners for students studying the American presidency and later in the Calico School studying politics and policy making in the US, locally and abroad, bringing practitioners to share their expertise to complement what we study in the classroom. And we were, and the commitment was to bring together the two major political parties, a senior official who had worked in the White House and with, closely with Congress in policymaking to share their insights and help us to reflect on what, uh, how Paul, what we study, the study of politics, how that actually works in practice. And we have two distinguished public servants speaking with Tay, who have joined us as Calico Senior Fellows to speak with us today. I'll start with the Hofstra alum, so I'll go from there. So it's not uh, non-alphabetical, but Phil Shalero, a Hofstra class of 1978, political science major. Um, <laughs> I believe, got inspired to work in Washington based on the political science trip to Washington, D.C. in 
uh, you probably your junior year, 77, uh, right? Or fall semester of my senior year. Yeah, okay. So go Washington trip, Dr. Dudek. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Phil Shalero was director of legislative affairs and special advisor to President uh, Barack Obama. He has more than 30 years of experience working on Capitol Hill and in the executive branch. He was President Obama's director of legislative affairs from 2009 to 2010 special advisor to the president in 2011, and the president's advisor for the Affordable Care Act and health care policy in 2013 and 2014. As President Obama's liaison to Congress, Phil Shalero played a key role in the passage of the Affordable Care Act and other historic laws and reforms in the first two years of the Obama administration, some of which he'll discuss with us today. Before going to the White House, Phil Shalero worked in Congress, serving as Representative Henry Waxman's Chief of Staff, serving as Democratic Staff Director for the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, Policy Director for Senate Minority Leader Tom Daschle, and Staff Director for the Senate Democratic Leadership Committees. During his time on Capitol Hill, Phil Shalero was actively involved in uh, working to pass legislation on health care and the environment, including the 1990 Clean Air Act. Since he left government in the Obama administration, Phil Shalero has found co-founded two nonprofits, Co-Equal and Grow New Mexico. Uh, in addition to his Hofstra degree, he earned a law degree from Lewis and Clark Law School in 1981. And in 2013, he received an honorary doctorate from Hofstra. In 2017, he delivered the first Lives in Public Policy and Public Service Address for the newly founded uh, that Peter S. Calico School of Government, Public Policy, and International Affairs. It's a pleasure to welcome you back, Phil. Mr. Ari Fleischer was the primary spokesperson for President George W. Bush and delivered daily White House briefings from 2001 <coughs> to 2003. Before he became White House Press Secretary, Ari, was, uh, Ari Fleischer was uh, the spokesperson for the Bush-Cheney <coughs> presidential campaign. In four years working for former President Bush, Ari Fleischer served as spokesperson during the presidential recount of 2000, at the time the most contentious election we had seen in, well, I think the first time in 112 years that the popular vote and the electoral college vote did not match up. Um, the September 11th terrorist attacks, two wars, and the anthrax attack. His best-selling book, Taking Heat, details his years in the White House and reached number seven on the New York Times bestseller list. But my understanding is he's going to top that uh, with a new book on the media that perhaps he'll share with us a little bit about that today. Before Mr. Fleischer joined the Bush campaign in 2000, Ari Fleischer was the national spokesperson and communications director for Elizabeth Dole's presidential campaign. He has worked previously on Capitol Hill as press secretary to members of the House of Representatives and U.S. Senator Pete Domenici. Uh, Ari Fleischer is a native of Pound Ridge, New York, 1982 graduate of Middlebury College, is currently president of his own firm, Ari Fleischer Communications, which offers advice to clients in the corporate and sports worlds on how to handle the press. He is also a Fox News contributor. And we are delighted to welcome Ari Fleischer back to Hofstra. I believe the last time, Ari, that you, when you visited was October 2008, before the presidential campaign, participated in one of our Educate 08 events before we hosted uh, the third presidential debate of 2008 on October 15th. It is wonderful to welcome you back to campus. Thank you, both of you, for joining us today. We'll begin by having uh, both Ari and Phil speak for a few minutes about the early Biden presidency, American politics and policymaking. Clearly, there's a lot to discuss. Um, we'll then have a small panel conversation, and we will reserve at least half an hour for audience questions, so be ready. Uh, when the questions begin, we'll move that microphone to the center, and we'll ask you to come up there um, to ask your question. And you may remove your um, mask when you ask your question so we can hear you. So without further ado, um, I don't think we discussed, I don't, I don't have a coin, I don't, whether, I'll let the two of you decide who speaks first. All right, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Whichever 
right. Well, Mina, thank you very much for, for the introduction. It was, um, of all the introductions I've ever had, I, I have to say that that is, without a doubt, the most recent. Uh, <laughs> But no, thank you so much for, for what you said. I apologize for not being a Hofstra graduate. <laughs> I understand that is a distinct advantage to be one. Um, but thank you so much. It's wonderful to see you, Mina. I actually met Mina when she was at West Point. When I used to visit up there to talk to classes. And going to classes is one of my favorite things to do now that I'm no longer a student. So thank you for having me to Hofstra. President Poser, thank you for all you're doing for Hofstra. And it's a real pleasure to see what a great group you have here and what a great university Hostra is. And Peter, much of this is to your credit. Thank you for your support, for your involvement, for your generosity. Thank you for making this possible. And keep doing it for a long, long time. <laughs> but I'm here today to talk about baseball. Four baseball fans are standing on top of a mountain arguing about which one loves their team the most. One is an Atlanta Braves fan, one's a Houston Astros fan, one's a Boston Red Sox fan, and the fourth is a New York Yankees fan. <laughs> the Astros fan looks at his three friends on the top of the mountain and says, none of you, none of you love your team as much as I love the Strohs, and to prove it, I'm going to leap off this mountain. So he walks up to the edge of the mountain, looks down, leaps off, and all you can hear is, this is for the Astros. Well, the Braves fan looks at the two remaining fans on top of the mountain says, neither of you love your team as much as I love the Braves. And to prove it, I'm going to jump off this mountain. He walks up to the edge of the mountain, looks down, leaps off, and all you can hear is, this is for the Braves. Well, that leaves the Yankee fan and the Red Sox fan alone <coughs> on top of the mountain. At which point, the Yankee fan walks up to the Red Sox fan, pushes him off the mountain, and says, this is for everybody. <laughs> Well, there's, there's something else that is for everybody, and it's the White House. I cannot begin to tell you how much I loved government service and how much I loved my job at the White House. Despite the polarization of the age in which we live, despite the fact that people just are sick and tired of so much of the fights that we're in, the fact of the matter is if you believe in a cause, if there is something that's in your heart that is in you, that is in your mind a problem that you want to solve, a cause that you want to belong to, get yourself to Washington and dive in. It is amazing the difference, especially that young people make in our system. And we need smart people, we need sharp people, we need civil people to get to that town and refresh that town and always make a difference in Washington. It is the best place I've ever seen for young people to have impact. You can spend years and years, decades in a corporate job. You can spend decades on Wall Street, and maybe you'll move up. In Washington, you can get involved and have a big impact fast, and especially for women. I've never seen a field that is so hungry for talent, that rewards people so fast, that women can rise up and shoot up, and I've worked for many, because it rewards merit and success. Get to that town if you care. Get to that town if you believe. And I believed standing at that podium. The best thing about being White House Press Secretary was every day, right around this time of day, right around lunchtime, Eastern time, I would walk up to that podium on live camera right after September 11th on the networks, on all the cables, on Al Jazeera, on TV, around the world, and assume the position <coughs> of a human pinata. <laughs> and let the press corps go to work. And that was the other thing I loved about it. Our First Amendment works. The press has an absolute right to ask whatever it is they want to ask, and my job was to answer to the best of my abilities on behalf of a man and on behalf of policies I believed in. I loved standing my ground. And that's the other fulfilling thing about politics, and it does not matter what party you belong to. Stand your ground. Advocate for what you believe and do your best in our system to work with the other party to see it through. And now it's somebody else's turn to stand their ground at the White House, and that's Joe Biden's time. I'm going to reserve most of my time for the Q's and A's because I think that's when we'll get to the most reflective questions. But I'll give you my summary of where Joe Biden is right now. 
He's in trouble. And the reason he's in trouble, he made the fundamental error that presidents are not supposed to make, which is he misread the American people. He misread why he got elected as president of the United States. He got elected as president of the United States to not be Donald Trump. This was the driving force behind the 2020 election. It was a rejection election. It was a rejection of how just too hot to handle Donald Trump became for too many people. He did not get elected to be Bernie Sanders. He beat Bernie Sanders in the, in the Democratic primary. But he misread his mandate now that he got in. And he's governing, in my opinion, too much to the progressive side of the Democratic Party, trying to win votes in a 50-50 Senate and in a three-vote House that simply doesn't exist for a massive redistribution of income spending agenda. I think if Joe Biden had instead won, recognizing his history as a fairly moderate senator, as a Democrat, and recognizing that we have a 50-50 Senate and a three-vote margin in the House, and if he had run straight up the middle and said, I challenge you Republicans to join with me, we're going to build coalitions, and he built that coalition from the middle out instead of from the far left now inward. I think the Joe Biden presidency would have been off to a far, far stronger start. He'd have been far more popular. He'd have more likely been able to build an incrementalism to getting policies passed on the Hill, which would give him more momentum to get the next policy passed on the Hill and give him strength as the president. But instead, he cast his lot with the left. And this is where it's bogged down. This is where it's become such an agonizing daily struggle the Democrats to see if they can unite around even a tailored back, a trimmed down tax and spend agenda that Joe Biden is now trying to put through. Key thing to leading the people is to understanding the people. And I submit to you that Joe Biden, who understood the people pretty well in the 2000 election, who made himself pretty small so that way Donald Trump could be pretty big, resulting in people not wanting Trump but preferring Biden. Once he got to office, he misplayed his hand. Hence, the difficulties he's in now. I'm sure you're going to have many questions about it, and I'll, I'll welcome those questions that, um, after Phil goes. And I just encourage you all, think about what you want to ask and, and let it rip. <laughs> ask about the hardest policy questions, political questions, career advice. What's Washington like? Phil and I are here to help you. We're here to answer your questions. But all I know is when I was in college and I had an opportunity to talk to people who had been in government, who had done things that they had done, I loved the chance to ask them what was ever on my mind. So with that, thank you again, President Poser. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Mina. Phil, thank you. Step right up. Thank you, Ari. Phil, we'll turn it over to you. You can go there or here, whichever you want. Yeah, we all have to know our limitations. And if I walk across the stage that way, <laughs> I'm going to knock something over. And it could be this behind us or it could be Peter this way. So I'm going to stay right here if you don't mind. Um, I want to add uh, my thanks uh, to Ari's for Peter, everything you've done to make this possible, your generosity, your vision, and just your, your commitment um, to everyone So at, here at Hofstra. Um, oh, they're already walking out on you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was just waiting for Mina because I wanted to thank her too. And <laughs> if she were, if she were leaving, thank you. Uh, but Mina, thank you for just being essential, uh, just an essential part of all of this. For the new president, for all the faculty here, there's no longer um, uh, any faculty in the political science department who were here when I was here, but there's there's still uh, one professor who's teaching now part time, who is one of my professors when I was here, Bernie Firestone, who um, I I was blessed when I was at Hofstra because um, one of the gifts of my life were the professors I had, uh, Bernie Firestone, Dr. Herb Rosenbaum, Paul Harper, Bill Levintrasser, uh, Mark Landis. They were all all just. <coughs> incredible and through my life as Mina knows and other people at Hofstra know one of the singular influences on my life were her, was Herb Rosenbaum who
who um, was somebody who escaped Nazi Germany uh, with his mom and brother, came here with essentially nothing, <coughs> became um, an anchor of the political science department for so long. And one of the things I always try to tell students, um, my experience may not be your experience, but in addition to the studies, spending time with some of those professors, spending time with Dr. Rosenbaum, who was always generous with it, um, really changed my life. And so it's, a, it's an honor for me to be back here at Hofstra. Every time I come back, it's, a, it's an honor. Um, I sometimes question Hofstra's wisdom about having me up here instead of the audience, <laughs> but I, I leave that to, I leave that to the, the uh, folks here. Um, but for all the students, really think about that with your professors. Think about the opportunity you have. Think about the opportunity things like the Calico Center is giving you that uh, in a lot of places it doesn't exist. And when you're done with your four years, you don't want to look back and say, gee, I should have done that, or I could have done that. I could have spent time with Professor Parati. I didn't do it. D really grab it with both hands and make the most of it. And when you have someone like Peter Calico here today, don't be shy about talking, to, talking with him as well because you can learn an awful lot about life and politics too, just by spending a couple of minutes with him. Um, Ari said something in, in his remarks uh, about civility. That's one of the things I deeply believe when it comes to politics and government, that there's too much shouting, uh, there's too much anger. Passion is good, but directed passion is even better. And, and um, operating, I think, Ari said, stand your ground. Stand your ground when you have the facts, too. Make sure you, you're operating from a factual basis, not just an emotional basis. That's the preachy part of what I was going to say. Um, the topic here is the first year of the Biden presidency. I was head of legislative affairs, so I, I kind of look at things through that prism a little bit. And I can tell you what it was like for me in my job in 2009. We, um, it's an amazing thing going into the office on inauguration, going into the White House on inauguration day, because it's different than almost any other entity in the United States. Peter can tell you this from a business standpoint. Usually if you're running a real estate business, if you're running a corporation, all the personnel doesn't change on a Tuesday, right? Somebody's behind, somebody's behind to do a handoff. That's not the way the White House works. On Tuesday morning, Monday, on Monday and then Tuesday morning, there's one set of people in the White House. And on Tuesday afternoon, new people start coming in. And they're supposed to know how to run the place. And they don't get any grace period. In our, our uh, time in 2009, we had an economy in free fall. Unemployment was going through the roof. We didn't realize how bad it was until we got the revised numbers two months later. But we were losing, depending on the month, in uh, November, December, January, February, six to 800,000 jobs a month being lost in the workforce. Unemployment was skyrocketing to over 10, 10%. We had towns in the Midwest that entire towns that were on the verge of going under because of the problems with the auto industry. You don't get to say the next day on Wednesday, OK, we'll deal with this in a month. We'll get back to you. We first have to figure out how this place operates. You got to start on the very first day. And when it comes to legislation, the foundation for everything is prioritization. There's a lot of demand. We followed eight years of a Republican president. And so there's pent up demand among the Democratic base at that point and about other people in the country. We want everything done at once. You can't do everything done at once. So they have to be prioritized and sequenced. And the legislative process tends to be messy. Prior to, in my view, cable TV, certainly to the internet and social media, it was a heck of a lot easier to do legislation because nobody really paid attention. It wasn't dealt with like a sporting event. So um, the New York Times might run a story, the Washington Post might run a story, people may read it, may not, but everything that's going on is not gonna be dissected on a day-to-day -day basis on cable TV or on social media. So two recent examples of that. One really recent right now, right? On the, the 
Ari talked about the president should have governed from the center out. I think he tried to do that on the infrastructure bill. That was a bipartisan bill in both, well, in the Senate and it will be in the House. But that's gotten held up to the second bill, which is the human infrastructure bill. You'll see we use different terms. So Ari called it a tax and spend bill. I'll call it a human infrastructure bill. <laughs> uh, but it's the same bill. So um, he tried on the first bill to do that. It wasn't going to be possible on the second bill. But if you follow the, the cable TV or, or news reports, it's whether it's going to be a three and a half trillion dollar bill, whether it's going to be a two trillion dollar bill, whether Joe Manchin is the devil incarnate, and it's really covered like a sporting event. That's not how legislation is supposed to work. It's not how you get the best legislation possible. For us, in 2009, we had the same dynamic right off the bat because we were trying to do a stimulus bill. Because Republican economists, Democratic economists were telling us if we didn't act quickly, that was the key word, if we didn't act quickly, the whole country was going to fall into a second Great Depression. So we actually had to start acting like we were in the White House before we were in the White House. The first bill President Obama did was completed the week before he became president. There was something, um, I don't think morning the students would know about it, some of the other folks, community might. There was a, a program called TARP. There were two tranches to TARP. The first was for 350 billion, the second was for 350 billion, which at the time was almost incomprehensible amounts of money. And this was only 12 years ago. Um, but as President Obama was coming in, the Bush White House economic team and the incoming Obama team were saying, we have to do this second tranche. Well, there were a few things as unpopular in the country at that time than the second tranche of TARP. That's the first thing we had to do. I accompanied President Obama to meet with the Senate Democratic Caucus the week before he was going to be sworn in telling them he knew this was going to be unpopular, but there was consensus this was in the best interest of the country, and they needed to vote for it, which they, they did that week. Um, then we had to simultaneously work on a $750 billion, which became an $800 billion stimulus bill. That may not seem like a lot of money today, because we throw around things like $3.5 trillion, but I'll give you the point of reference I had at the time. In 1983, I'm sorry, 1993, Bill Clinton had to do a stimulus bill because the country was in a little bit of a recession. That bill was $16 billion, and it took until July to do. And when it passed, the deciding Democratic vote was being, um, was being serenaded with chants on the House floor, bye-bye, because you're going to lose. We had to do what seemed politically impossible at the time. The $750, $800, dollars $800 billion stimulus bill, and we had to do it quickly, and we only had, at that point, 58 Democratic senators. We needed 60. We weren't doing it through reconciliation. We couldn't have done it through reconciliation. Even though we had 58 Democratic senators, we had one who didn't want to vote for it. And as we discovered as we went through the process, I'm now really in the weeds. This is more than you want to know, but I find it fascinating. If we got that senator, we only needed two Republicans. But it turned out we needed three Republicans because none of our three potentials wanted to be the 60th vote. So we had to get three in order to get two. So we had to get three Republicans plus a recalcitrant uh, Senate Democrat who was from a very conservative state which we ended up being able to do by mid-February. And then going forward for the rest of that first year, it was trying to get as much done as quickly uh, as possible and doing that prioritization. And because there was so much attention at the time, each time a president engages in a legislative fight, his poll numbers are going to go down. And even when legislation ends up being really popular, there aren't that many people here who will remember this, but Lyndon Johnson had a very successful Congress in 1965 and 1966. I'm sure Peter remembers this. We passed Medicare, we passed Medicaid, we passed the Civil Rights Act, and in the next election, Democrats got walloped. 
they didn't lose control of the House and Senate. We certainly lost a lot of seats. That um, is, is on everyone's mind as the year is going on, and you can see it playing out right now for the Biden presidency. Ari's right that it's a, it's a tough time. Poll numbers are going down. But we're not at the end of the story. And to pick up where um, Ari started with baseball, I feel like we're in the second inning, the third inning right now. There's a long way to go. But you don't pick that up on cable because it's all treated as if we're at the end and this is fluid. Most presidents don't have a good midterm election, but that doesn't mean every president's not gonna have a good midterm election. It's just impossible to know right now. So um, I wanna second something, also second something Ari said. We just welcome as many questions as, as you can throw at us today. Really urge you to have as much of an engaged discussion as we can. Your being here is really the most important thing, not because we're here, but because you're involved. Because you're thinking about these kinds of issues or else you wouldn't be here. And for our democracy, your informed involvement, your informed engagement is the reason a lot of us have optimism for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil, and thank you, Ari. Um, I'm gonna ask three questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. So I have a question about timing, about strategy, and about people. Um, and, and actually, Phil, I should mention, since you brought up uh, Peter uh, in the 1960s, graduated class of 65 from Hofstra, Martin Luther King was the commencement speaker that year, I believe, right? So it's, uh, there's a, a lot of, a lot of important history here. I, I have a picture with him somewhere. We haven't found it yet, but I don't have it. Yeah, we need to put it in the ark. We need it. <laughs> It'll go up there as soon as we I'm find looking. it. My first question is about time, because from my calculations, and I didn't, I didn't look at this, look at this up on my phone, but we're about 378 days from the midterm elections. I believe they'll be November 8th, 2022, and it seems to me. I appreciate Ari your point about consensus building, about kind of building a coalition to, to look ahead. But it seems to me that a president's calendar is almost like a sieve. The, it's, it's, you know, like a, the glass, um, the, uh, thank you, the hourglass, where it's just the time is going. And with a razor thin majority in the House, a tie in the Senate with a tie breaking vote, the, the pressure to act is now. And, and as Phil was describing, both of you were describing the daily press of events and the need to compete with multiple factors. It seems to me that a president can't afford to take the risk of saying, I'll hold off, because you don't know in just over a year from now whether you'll have even less of an opportunity to take action than you do now. So I'm just curious for both of your thoughts on that. Well, I think that's absolutely true. You have your maximum momentum when you're elected. So in January 2021, Joe Biden was at his height, having come off of a victory. But then you have to be realistic because he wasn't elected in a victory that brought a House and a Senate with him. What should he do? Should he trim his sails? And in fact, the Democrats thought they were going to gain seats in the House in the 2020 election. They came in with about a 18-vote um, majority in the House uh, heading into Election Day 2020, and they lost 14 to 15 seats. So it was a shock to the Democrat system that they didn't gain seats in the House. Now, they took the Senate because of the Georgia debacle for Republicans and have a 50-50 Senate. They didn't have a 58-42 Senate the way Barack Obama did, where Barack Obama could say, this is our time. We have all these pent-up demands. We're going to pounce. We don't have much time. The hourglass is trailing. So what, if I were Joe Biden, the historical moderate, I would have said, I don't have the numbers to get through the agenda that the progressive movement would like me to get through. So I'm going to create a new coalition in politics. I'm going to create this centrist, right up the middle coalition. There's no guarantee it would have happened. Maybe he wouldn't have had the votes there anyway. Although I think if he had run a pure infrastructure bill, he absolutely would have had the votes. That had already been in law of the land and signed and in the books. I think he could have had a smaller stimulus package than the $1.9 trillion that was spent on top of the $6 trillion that was spent last year. 
That's why I call it tax and spend. It's a long spending spree that both parties have engaged in. But I think you could have had a bipartisan vote on that at much less of a price if it only had focused on COVID. The $1.9 trillion that was spent by President Biden when he first came in was really another stimulus bill. It was another redistribution of income bill. It was another transportation bill. All kinds of money are in there. I was reading today that there's unused funds that Chicago was going to use now to create a universal income for 5,000 residents of Chicago. So that has nothing to do with COVID, but they passed a mega spending bill calling it COVID that had nothing to do with COVID. He could have bipartisan support if it only was about COVID relief. So he cast his lot one way. I think he could have actually gained more time and more strength in his hourglass if he had actually been a centrist and a moderate and was able to win the votes from the center of both parties. And it would have jumbled American politics at a time when so many people are so sick of everybody running to the base and the extremes. He could have been the breakthrough politician. He chose otherwise. And that's why to go back to baseball, I think you're right. He's in the second, third inning. It still is the beginning of the game, so to speak. But the, your starting pitcher is getting shelled. And the other team got the bases loaded right now. That's the problem. Thank you, Ari. Phil, any comment? Uh, I have extensive comments, and so I'm trying to self-edit. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what Ari Are you trying to go to the video review to say it's <laughs> only men on first and second? Yeah. I think Ari's exactly right on the approach. Um, if it works, if, if, it's, if, it's, if there's the opportunity for it. And I'm going to do a, I have something in my head of, of where we are in the cycle, where we've been in for a while, but I want to address this first. When President, President Obama gets criticized for two things that are diametrically opposed, okay? He gets criticized by people on the left for getting elected by a big margin with 58 Democratic senators, with 250-something House members, and not being liberal enough, and not doing enough for it. So he, he was too, too moderate. He also gets criticized for being a wild radical in his first two years and trying to do things like the Affordable Care Act when he shouldn't have. Well, both of those can't be true. And the reality is neither one is true. And I could say this because I was there and I, I saw it firsthand. One of the first things the president did in his first month was bring Republicans and Democrats down to the White House. And we had a forum. This is a Democratic president. We had a, um, a forum on fiscal responsibility to talk about deficits that exploded during the Bush years. What do we need to, what do we need to do to bring them down? And one of the consensus items in that day was we need to deal with health care, that we can't get our, our budget in order unless we deal with health care. So then we did a second one on just health care with all the leading Republicans, all the leading Democrats, trying to find a bipartisan path forward. And on both issues, even though when we did the, the um, stimulus I mentioned, we had $300 billion in tax cuts, we were only able to get three Republicans in the Senate to vote for it. My direction from the president was be tireless in trying to get Republican support for issues we were doing. So one of the first bills we did was a Kennedy Hatch bill that Senator Hatch wanted us to do on public service. That was what we moved that up in the agenda item because a Republican senator asked us to do it. We tried and succeeded in the first five months of building bipartisan coalitions on lots of bills. But when it came to health care, and it was a smart political decision, the, the theory Senator Mercano articulated is make them do it on their own. We can't, if we give them, if, we, if we're part of it, we can't attack it, it becomes a bipartisan issue. And that sort of culminated for me in an August meeting of 2009 where President Obama brought folks down to the Oval Office, Democrats and Republicans, and talked, leaned over to one of the Republic, leading Republicans at the time who had been involved in two months of negotiations on health care and said, if I give you, if I agree to everything you're asking for, will you be for the bill? And the senator said no. Well, I don't know how you can do a deal like that in business if you've negotiated for two months and you say, if I agree to all your terms, will you be there? Then what are you doing? So one of the lessons people on 
the Democratic side took from those years and from things that followed later is this isn't on the level. We can try to do things, we can try to reach out, but it's not gonna be reciprocity. That probably hit its zenith with, well, let me take one step back. We had a Supreme Court opening in 2009, and President Obama called around to Democrats and Republicans in the Senate and said, give me your recommendations. And one of the recommendations that came um, from several senators on the Republican side was you should appoint Merrick Garland, which President Obama did not do in 2009. But he subsequently did later in his presidency, and Senator McConnell wouldn't even give him a hearing. The message that sent to Democrats is the rules are being made up as you go along. And I think it gets us to a place, and again, this relates directly, and I'm agreeing with Ari, it, it goes exactly what he's saying, is we've got this dynamic that's not a good one right now, but when someone like Joe Biden gets elected, he gets elected because the Democratic base is really activated. It's energized, it's outworking, it's turning out votes. And on top of that, he's able to pull in this election a majority of moderates. That gives a winning, a winning majority. Doesn't necessarily give a governing majority because as Ari correctly points out, going into election day, Democrats thought they were gonna pick up 15 House seats. I think they ended up losing 11. That's very, very different. Huh? 14. 14. Um, Democrats thought they had an excellent chance to win Senate seats in places like North Carolina. Every, there are five Senate seats I can think of right now that Democrats thought they had a really good chance of winning and they lost all of them. Now, President Biden comes into the White House and, and people are really excited on the Democratic base because they won. So we've got the White House, the House, and Senate. We have a majority in those places, but not a governing majority. And so, you do get pulled to your base because that's where the enthusiasm is. The more a president gets pulled to the base, the farther the president gets from independence. And when the process plays out as it has over the last 80 years or so, as the first two years go on, the, the base gets discouraged, the independents move away, the opposition gets energized, and the midterm elections are tough and the poll numbers are bad as it goes on, regardless of what the president's accomplishing or not accomplishing, which is why we talked about this earlier today. Over the last 100 years, there have only been three instances where the party that controls the White House hasn't had a tough midterm election. I can't explain why that happens. All I can say is, with a 100-year database, there's something about the American people that doesn't really like united government that notwithstanding everything everybody says, the record shows we just don't have it very often. All right, any com comment? No? Well, I'm actually, I had two more questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll hold on them because I think we've raised a lot of topics for discussion. Um, I was going to ask about public versus private legislative strategies and whether the current leadership in Washington can actually get things done. But let, let, me, let me hold those for now. Maybe I'll come back to them. Uh, why don't we, if uh, there are questions, if you'd like to come to the microphone, um, we'd like to encourage students particularly. And as you're thinking about your question and getting ready, let me ask uh, Peter Calico if there's any question you'd like to ask. No, it's we'll open it up. Okay, me. please students, don't be shy. Somebody has to get up. I wish you were the White House press corps. All <laughs> right. Days Caitlin, a lot easier. Or, please. And you can take off your mask while you're asking. Oh, cool. yeah. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm a journalism major, so I, I'm also a political science major. But I love the 24-hour news cycle. I live for it. I love the way <laughs> politics are covered, which is kind of controversial. Um, but I'm curious what you both, well, what all four of you think about how Biden would be evaluated if we didn't have that 24-hour cycle. I think it would have been much healthier for Joe Biden if we didn't. I think it would be healthier for everybody if we didn't. You know, back before there was the internet and cable, but especially the internet, let's limit it to that, social media and the way things are now with all these newsletters that tell you everything you need to know about Washington, the 24-hour cycle on social media. 
Reporters used to cover, let's well, stay with baseball. They used to cover the full game. Game's over, and they report to you how the game was played, who won, who lost. Cable news comes along with 24-hour cable. Now they're starting to cover every inning. <laughs> now with social media, they're covering every pitch. I mean, deputy assist, uh, ass, unknown White House aides, if they give them a juicy enough quote to Politico, that quote can drive a news cycle for days. Whether or not that junior A was ever in the meeting or not, if they something juicy enough, oh, that's a 24-hour cycle. In the old days, where Joe Biden really was stronger, he got covered for the full game. What were you able to accomplish at the end of the day for the American people? And I'm not a fan of the 24-hour news cycle. I mean, you, I can't stop it. I don't want to stop it. You cannot stop technology and don't even try. But think about this, and then I'll, I'll end on this note. The two institutions in the American government that have the highest esteem, the highest polling numbers in the American people, even though they're both down, are the Federal Reserve and the Supreme Court compared to the Congress and the White House. Congress and the White House do everything in public and have 24-hour scrutiny. The Supreme Court has no reporters present when they deliberate and come out with their decisions. Same thing with the Fed. There's something about a serious, thoughtful, deliberative information process and decision-making process outside of the 24-hour prying eyes that the public actually likes more because the press just happens to stir the pot against whoever's in power, more so for Republicans, I would say, but they stir the pot in a way that negativity prevails. And that's a real problem for the country. So 24-hour coverage, it's the way it is, but it doesn't make it good. Thank you. I, I completely agree. Um, Ari was using a, a sports analogy before. And um, it, it drives me crazy if I go on a site like ESPN and there's a football game going on and it's the first quarter and they're predicting the probability of victory yeah. in the first quarter, which is just crazy. The team's up 7 nothing, and it's an 82% probability they're going to win. They haven't even played the game yet, right? There's so much more to go. Um, your journal is a major, so you probably know this. So on cable TV, there's a real incentive to keep putting up breaking news or developing story. There is no breaking news, there's no developing story, but it brings people in. And I don't watch cable coverage, but I do spend a lot of time in the House and Senate. And I find that when I'm waiting in an office and they have on MSNBC or CNN or Fox, whatever's there, I end up getting jittery. Because <laughs> I do. Because it seems like something's always about to happen. <laughs> And so people watching that on a daily basis, I think it's really bad for them. I think it creates anxiety. And I think Ari was right before about this past election. People wanted government to be boring again. They didn't want to think about it. They just wanted to be competent, stay out of their way, do its job. They don't want to see breaking news all the time. They don't want to live at the edge of their seat what about Kristen Sinema is going to do. Without the kind of coverage we have, that wouldn't happen. You would have the same underlying dynamic. Kristen Sinema may have not have decided, but she wouldn't have five million people on edge because they want her to do something she's not doing. So we have to figure out a balance. And I think he's right that you know there's probably no going back. But I hope we'll get adjustments as time goes on. Thank you. Kate, I think that points to the importance of both your journalism and political science majors. Yes. And I should point out that you're writing a senior thesis in political science. Am I correct? <laughs> okay, thanks. And if you ever become a White House pr uh, reporter, be really nice to the press secretary. <laughs> Please. Um, hello. Um, one of my majors is also political science. I'm a psychology and political science double major. Um, my question is a little more broad. I was wondering, you know, this country is more politically polarized than it's ever been before. We're divided, and I wanted to ask how we can become a coalition, as you were discussing earlier, one that can create change, systematic change, within the state. I'll start. I'm fascinated by your double major, politics and psychology. Um, the politicians need a lot of psychiatrists. Um, you know, I, I'm sure the or origins of the word politics. It, it comes from the Greek word poly, meaning many, 
and ticks, meaning blood-sucking creatures. Uh, your question gets to the essence of why we're divided today. And my view is, like most things in politics, it's simple. There are so many reasons it can get bogged down and complicated, but the simplicity is people follow leaders. When a strong enough leader comes along who can break right through the center for reasons that appeal to the center left and the center right, that leader is going to have more followers. Now, if they try it and they don't have the votes, it's going to be a failure. But some things are worth testing and experimenting on. I'm fascinated by Colin Powell. If Colin Powell had been the one in 1996 to have run for the presidency, and well, could he have been that breakthrough figure, even back then when things were less polarized? So it's going to take somewhat of an outsider, highly respected, influential leader with tremendous strength and conviction. And then they'll see if they can assemble these coalitions that people will follow. I think in terms of ideas, there's enough agreement around ideas without the edges that things can get done. It's just a question, is there a leader who can fight to do it as opposed to appeal to their base? So we just have to wait and see if such a leader comes along. Um, I'll just do a short add on to that. Also with your, your major, um, I was struck about a month ago, I saw a, a Democrat on TV who said, they were asked about Kristen Cinema, and, and they were on opposite sides of the vote. And the Democrats said, my job isn't to get inside her head. My reaction was, that's exactly what your job is. If you want to convince her to be with you, you have to get inside her head. You have to be thinking of the, what, what she's thinking. What are the pressures she's feeling and bring it over? So even on intra-party stuff, there's not enough of that. So that that's... Um, that's the first thing I'd say. The second thing is, I think what makes it so hard to do what you're talking about is in our society today, conflict sells. Agreement doesn't, right? So you don't watch TV shows if everybody's sitting around agreeing. That's why on cable TV, on other, um, other kinds of shows, you try to get conflict. I know people, I have to, I, I shouldn't say this because I don't know what I'm talking about. But I know people who watch shows like The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. And I take it that there's conflict built into those shows so that people are fighting again. That keeps people engaged. They want to watch it. When you have kumbaya moments in politics, most people don't care. They don't pay attention. So you have to figure out, and I heard Ari say this earlier today in another context, but you have to flip the incentives and disincentives and the people who decide that at the end of the day are not politicians, they're the American people. The American people have to decide they want consensus, not division. Can I just do a quick follow-up to that? Because I, I think this point is, how do you build that consensus with the American people without strong leadership from the two major political parties, which are our organizing forces in American politics? Well, that's where it has to come, and I, I believe in that. But it ends up being in one party's or the other's interest to have conflict. That's the, that's the, the predicate in our current system for, get, for success. And so that's, the, that's really the challenge, is to get critical mass. I think President Biden would love to bring 30 Republicans on board for a bill. I think that's going to be hard to do. We just start with a debt limit, right? We saw it early this year, regardless of your politics, Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal. We saw it earlier this year on the impeachment vote over January 6th, right? And we see what happens to the Republicans in the House and, and the ones in the Senate who voted for impeachment. A lot of the ones in the House are leaving the House because they don't see a future in, in that. Um, it has to be the way Ari said of, of a leader who's making it a priority, but that leader support among his or her own base is going to erode if there are no results to show for it. But there's a pendulum to our politics, too. When people get sick and tired of the fact that nobody's doing anything, the first time somebody can break through over the middle and show they actually got something done, there's going to be this roar of approval for that person, which will then self-effectuate more successes because the public has reacted well to it. And that's when the pendulum swings. 
Colin Powell, and one of his sayings was that uh, optimism, I think, is a force multiplier. Yes, that's right? a great line. Right. The only thing I'd say about that, again, I'll, I, this is um, my own personal perspective, but when we got to the end of the first two years of the Obama administration, people were comparing it to the first two years of the Johnson administration. They said there had to be another Congress that got as much done in those two years, important things, big things done. None of that resonated with the public, even on the things where we brought Republicans on board. It, it just doesn't get as much attention as failure. So I just, that's my only skepticism with that. I would love what Ari said to be true, that it, it inspires more um, energy in the public I just, and I, I'm an optimist too. I think we will get there. I just don't think we're there yet. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Okay, hello. I'm also a psychology and political science major. Um, I just started the political science route, so I'm fresh into this. Um, but what I realized uh, while getting into more of the political science field, um, I feel like for Joe Biden, for instance, with our world being more, you know, social media and we have access to so much and when someone or president does something wrong, you know, we can get that and see it immediately. Do you feel like as a president, they're more so interested in how they look to the crowd and um, that's what makes their judgment on what they choose to fix first with your little time, uh, I don't know what to call it, with the time period that they have, do you feel like they're more so with what issues are more out socially that should be fixed rather than i guess other issues like money stuff and taxes and things like that if that makes sense i don't know mm -hmm. um i think every president is concerned about image and and poll numbers because their ability to have success within their own party revolves around how strong they look in public but i don't think for most presidents it drives what they do and mm -hmm. I, I think they i um I think the president's priorities often are the ones that they genuinely think are the most important that, or the highest on their priority list. So it's not based necessarily on popularity. My experience watching presidents, they a lot of times will try to do something popular, but most of the time they're trying to do something in the best interest of the country. You know, I would say Joe, Joe Biden's a throwback. He's a throwback to the pre-social media backslapping era. That's where he is most comfortable. But his problem is his party is a throw forward where they want that progressive agenda and they want it this year, they want it done. And that's the strain he's under. Um, when it comes to image, et cetera, there was one president very recently from 2016 to 2020 who actually did think the image and the entertainment was probably more important than the governance. And that was President Trump. I mean, he loved the rallies. He fed off the rallies. To me, the rallies were nice but they were not a measure of America. They were the measure of people who show up for your rally. Now, he could get more people there than anybody else. And he was riveting at these things in, in kind of sometimes weird ways. I mean, it was entertainment. It wasn't good governance. So that's where he placed his priorities as president. And along the way, had some incredible substantive successes. I would make the state, I believe he had some incredible personal failures, but he had incredible substantive successes, including the fact that pre-pandemic, the poverty rate was at the lowest level in 2019, prior to the pandemic, ever measured since 1958. Child poverty was at its lowest in history in 2019. And Middle East, the Abraham Accords, four Arab nations made peace with Israel. This had never happened before. So there were a series of things that he did by being a bull in the China shop, and everywhere he went, he brought a new China shop with him, uh, <laughs> that made him just incredibly different and controversial because he did put his reputation. He thought that's what everything was driven by. Um, it's not Biden, and that's why he was elected. As I said, Trump turned out to be too hot to handle. But I'm for a calmer era. I am for politicians being different. I am for politicians actually connecting with voters rather than being boring. But I'd like to see something in between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Thank you. Question. I see the students are lining up, so I won't ask my follow-ups now. Please, go. One of my students, go ahead. 
Um, I, I'm a public service and public policy major, um, and my question was... Um, hey, Josh, could you just move oh, the microphone up a little? Yeah, there you okay. go. Okay. Um, my question was, both of you had kind of mentioned being behind the scenes, being in the rooms where the discussions are happening, and um, for sure, Mr. Schlero, uh, you mentioned that there was like a lack of trust and a lack of faithfulness when you're having these conversations that... You know, even if you agreed to everything that, that was on the table and that you were negotiating about, the other side still wouldn't come and support you. How do you um, rebuild that kind of trust and that kind of civility, as you had mentioned before, for this system to work again? Yeah, my, my view on that is um, you don't become jaded, you just keep trying. There's, there's no percentage in giving up. So you just keep reaching out, keep trying to find where the common ground is. And most of my experience in government, and I, I, because I was there for a long time, I ended up working on a lot of legislation when I was in Congress and when I was in the White House. Nearly all of it in my history was bipartisan. Even when we had, I, let me put it this way, there were not a single big issue I worked on that took less than 10 years. Can you imagine how frustrating that is? To, for every big issue you're working on to take at least 10 years. But you know how satisfying it is when you finally pick the lock and you get the thing done and it works, right? The, the trick is in all those fights, there were times when it seemed like it was never gonna happen. We were never gonna find the sweet spot and there was distrust, but we managed to do it. Now is a little bit different because it's escalated a little bit more. We also have a problem of, I'm sitting up here, and if this side of the room agreed with me that I had a green blazer on today, and this side of the room is looking at it and saying, you've got a blue blazer, but I get these people riled up that I have a green blazer on, it's gonna be very hard to find consensus. That to me is one of our fundamental uh, challenges to do what you're talking about now. But that takes me right away to the Biden administration. I mean, Phil's right, you just grind forward. That's what you're supposed to do in government, and you don't stop, no matter how tough it is. And hopefully the pendulum swang back, so you've got more strength going into it. But it's a matter of presidential decision making. President Biden could have had that infrastructure bill, the physical infrastructure bill, done and signed into law by now if he wanted it. But instead, three, four weeks ago, he went up to Capitol Hill and said, don't pass the bill that I am for, House tie it to this other bill, the tax and spend bill, and don't pass the infrastructure bill for roads, bridges, and highways, and internet, until and unless you're able to pass this mammoth tax and spending bill. So I'm hijacking my own bipartisan agenda to attach it to something that's incredibly controversial that I know I won't get any Republican votes for. Now, it's passed in the Senate already, this infrastructure bill, the highway bill, with huge, with significant bipartisan vote, kind of like in the old days. And if the Democrats could get a majority for it in the House, if they would vote for it, you'd get probably 40 to 50 Republicans voting for it as well. And it would have been signed into law. So this is a case of presidential decision making where he made the bet that he can get both because he's going to tie it to the progressive wish list. And he may end up with zero and blow this opportunity to have had a bipartisan accomplishment. So. These are the decisions presidents make. This is the decision President Biden made, and we're watching it unfold before us. I can't handicap it. I don't know if he's going to get zero uh, or get this done. I just don't know. Could I do a respectful dissent? You always do. <laughs> <laughs> so on this, this is a good example, um, because the infrastructure bill passed the Senate. Speaker Pelosi committed to bringing it up in late September for the House floor. President Biden supported that. When they were trying to bring it to the House floor, Leader McCarthy on the Republican side was whipping his members to oppose the bill that was a bipartisan bill in the Senate and that a group of House Republicans had already agreed to vote for. He was doing that because he knew liberals in the House wanted to oppose the bill unless they got the human infrastructure bill done at the same time. Notwithstanding that, Speaker Pelosi was driving to try to get that vote. The harder she drove, the harder the Republican leadership in the House was driving its members to oppose it. And at the end of the day, the votes weren't going to be there, notwithstanding what the White House was doing, notwithstanding what the Speaker was doing, so then the vote would fail. And when it comes to Congress, 
nothing counts if you don't get the votes. So that, that's sort of what you need. So yeah, that's a little bit of the but, behind the scenes dynamic. But this is where Biden yielded to Pelosi and he didn't have to. He didn't. Though, he because, let Nancy Pelosi tell him how the process should work instead of President Biden making the case that no, you need to whip those Democrats, get all the Democrats in line, get them to support it. We need bipartisanship. We need to improve our bridges, roads, Wi-Fi. And he chose not to. So I don't accept that just because Nancy Pelosi said it was the right strategy, that Joe Biden had to acquiesce to the Speaker of the House. He could have proved he was cut from a different cloth. He chose not to. And again, this is where we'll have a, a civil disagreement. Nancy Pelosi was driving the entire week to bring the vote to a, to bring the bill to a vote. She had committed to do it. She had committed to a group of Democrats in the House she was going to do it. She was working with the White House behind the scenes to do it. But she ran into a wall of opposition. She couldn't move, and the president couldn't move. And when you got to that point, that's when the president came up and said, take more time. But they couldn't move because the Democrats didn't support them. That was an internal Democrat problem. They would have had 40 or 50 Republican votes if the Democrats had gone to 50%. You, you, you've created a huge problem because we're just going to keep talking about your question. But, but they would have lost about 50 Democrats on that vote. But if they could have picked up 50 Republicans to reflect the bipartisan nature of it, it would have passed and they would have done it. But they weren't going to pick up 50 Republicans. They were going to pick up 10 or 15. When 50 Republicans, of course, should have supported it because it reflected a bipartisan consensus and not a controversial issue. It was, real, it was bridges, it was roads, things like that. Get out of here now so other people can ask <laughs> questions. I, and let me just say how much we appreciate the civil disagreement that we're seeing play out right here. If only it were a model for Washington. Next question, please. I hope you get a flat tire driving on bad roads on your way home. All right, uh, I'm a sports management major, although I do plan on minoring in uh, political science. Uh, I have a couple questions for Mr. Uh, Flesher based on the attacks of uh, September 11th. Um, the first one is, what went through your head when you first realized that this was an attack? It, especially when you knew you had to speak um, on live television yeah. the next day. I yeah. think you better ask your questions together because then we'll have to okay. make sure the ones behind okay, you. Okay, sorry. Okay? Um, no, and sorry. then the other question is, uh, and how do you feel... Uh, do you feel that America coming together uh, after the attacks uh, made your job easier? Like, for example, uh, growing up a Mets fan, uh, like Mike Piazza's home run yeah. on the first game back, that's just an example yeah. of uh, everyone coming together. Uh, do you feel that made your job easier? Well, first and foremost, I prefer to remember George Bush's pitch at the Yankees <laughs> World Series rather than Piazza's yeah. home run. Fair enough. But it was nice Piazza hit the home run. Um, Answer your second question first. No question, it made my job easier that the American people rallied. Mm -hmm. you know, Bush had a 90% job approval for two reasons. One is the country naturally rallied. This is what America does. When somebody attacks us, we join together real fast, regardless of party or anything else. Um, and secondly, Bush demonstrates strong leadership, and the country responded to his leadership, so the two reinforced each other. Just as a side note, for anybody who may be studying international affairs, China, through the State Department, seeing this tremendous grassroots rallying of the American people and this fierce, wonderful patriotism we had on September 11th forward, China asked the State Department, what steps did the United States government take to create this? And our reaction was, what do you mean? And they said, well, what did you do? I mean, you obviously whipped this up. You created it. Well, we had nothing to do with it. This was the American people. This is natural. China could never understand that. They thought it was always top down to dictate bottom up. Huge difference between us and China. It's one of the reasons, as much as I'm worried about China, the United States has a tremendous advantage because we don't do that. Um, on your first question, it's, it will forever be etched in my mind. Uh, I was arriving at the Booker Elementary School in Sarasota with the president for a routine reading event, a very bipartisan event launched as part of a huge bipartisan education package that ultimately passed with Senator Ed, Ted Kennedy being one of the chief sponsors of it, a huge bipartisan accomplishment. So that day was meant to kick off all this bipartisanship in education. I get out of the uh, motorcade, and back then I had a little a pager, an old-fashioned pager. None of you guys know what pagers are. <laughs> I mean, this, this is like Bob Dole talking about he had a phonograph. Oh, no, that was Joe Biden who said he had a phonograph oh. to put people to bed. Um, so my pager goes off, 
And it said a plane hit the World Trade Center. And I just thought, some type of terrible accident. And this can't be a plane hit the World Trade Center. It's an accident. And I'm in the schoolroom as the president is then reading to the kids. And I'm about 20 feet over the president's left shoulder leaning against a wall, and I didn't see the video of this until some six or seven years after September 11th when I happened to be watching one of these documentaries. And I'm on camera, actually, when I got a second page. And the second page was from my office in the White House saying, a second plane's hit the second tower. And my face just got this glum, grim look. And I instantly knew it had to be terrorism. And probably about 30 seconds later, 60 seconds later, Andy Card, the president's chief of staff, walked in the room, whispered in the president's right ear, the second plane hit the second tower, America's under attack. And for me, the biggest takeaway of September 11th, having had a background entirely in domestic issues in 17 years in Capitol Hill, Budget Committee, Ways and Means Committee, everything domestic focused, the entire 2000 campaign domestic focused. I heard the president on Air Force One as I stayed at his side for pretty much the whole day say to the vice president and to the secretary of defense, we're at war. And it sent a shiver down my spine because we were attacked. I knew the president meant it when he said we're at war. And here he is putting the mission in his top people. You're going to prepare for war. And I knew everything about the world was going to be different from that moment forward. And sure enough, we went to war, of course, to defend our country. So thank you for the question. Thank you. We have about just under 10 minutes, and I think we can get through all three of these questions if we move forward, OK? So please, go ahead. Hi. Um, I'm a political science major with minors in educational studies and philosophy. Um, and my question is, where do you all see the future of education going when it comes to politics and the structure of politics within America? Do you see more people wanting to get involved and wanting to understand politics, or do you believe there will be a downfall as there is more and more confusion being brought into politics due to social media, media bias, and opinionated journalism? Well, I, I can tell you based on the Virginia race, there, there's been an awakening in America among conservatives about what's happening at school boards. And I moderated a discussion about two weeks ago with Glenn Youngkin, who was the run, running for Republican governor of Virginia. And I asked him why all of a sudden Virginia is this hot ground of all the school board activity and protest. And his answer was that while conservatives are just busy building careers and living their lives, Democrats, progressives, and teachers unions spent a lot of their focus on school boards. And they largely ran unopposed for school board elections, and conservatives really didn't play in that sandbox. And so a lot of people got elected who represented one philosophy of America. And Combine that with the pandemic when all of a sudden moms and dads are home for the first time with their kids watching really what their kids are learning and seeing their school books and the teaching lessons, et cetera. And Youngkin's takeaway on that was conservatives became very concerned about what was happening on, on the school levels. And that is what energized so much of this now grassroots protest that's taking place throughout Virginia and much of the country. Um, so. For better or worse, whatever people think of it, yes, I think you're going to see this new generation of Republicans and conservatives be energized about, now I'm talking high school and, let, and below, uh, education and what the curriculum includes and what role parents have in that curriculum. And many of the flashpoints that have been kind of taken for granted that that's just the way society is are now getting litigated, and it's messy. But it's part of our political process, so yeah, I think you're going to see a lot more of it. We're short on time. Yeah. I'll just say I'll, yeah. I'll just say I disagree with most of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll, take, we'll let you lead on the next question. <laughs> Please go ahead. No, that's okay. <laughs> Mia? That was the best <laughs> answer you've given. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, thank you for coming. Um, I'm a political science and psychology major as well. Seems like there's a lot of us here. <laughs> um, my question is particularly for you, Mr. Fleischer, based on something that you said earlier. Um, so why do you think that moderacy never lasts? I know you mentioned um, well, that when someone proposes a more centrist idea, the pendulum kind of swings in American politics, yet it never seems to stay in the middle. I think it's safe to say that the two-party system might affect that, but do you think that an introduction of a more centrist party, if the system were to change and allow, would change this? It's a huge unknown, but my case is that if Joe Biden, having come from the center of the Democratic Party, perfectly situated to do it in terms of his comportment and his ideology, 
recognizing he had a 50-50 Senate and a three-vote House, if he had been the one to test it, it would have been our best provable case of could it or could it not have worked, mm -hmm. especially with all the desire to calm things down, leave the Trump years and, and the anger and the mood behind. I think that was the perfect proving ground. So in many ways, I'm disappointed he didn't take that route. It was his inaugural address was about. His whole soul, he said, was in for unity. So there's no guarantee it may not have worked. My point about the pendulum is I think when people are fed up with nothing happening, mm -hmm. they'll want something to happen. Okay. And that something can come from the center as opposed to, all right, the right didn't get it done, so now let the left get it done. The left didn't get it done, now let the right get it done. Somehow there's a center still. I think we lost the ability to find out because he didn't take that path. I, I'm just going to jump in just for a, you just direct that at me, but um, I tried to be restrained on the last question. I'll be a little <laughs> less restrained on this one. Look, Joe Biden got elected in November. Mm -hmm. He clearly won the presidency. Mm -hmm. He won the popular vote. He won the electoral vote. For the first time, a, the incumbent president refused to concede, refused to say his opponent won the election, refused to agree to a peaceful transfer of power resulted in an insurrection on January 6th, which turned violent, and people died. The House, the Capitol, one of the, to me, one of the most sacred places in our country for democracy, was invaded, not by a foreign force, but a domestic force who came in. And we came this close, this close to those people getting the box with the electoral college ballots. This close to that. And think about the chaos would have ensued if they did get it. One of the chilling things about that day is that it wasn't just a mob out of control. They went to the parliamentarian's office in the Senate. I worked in the Senate. I worked in the House and Senate for more than 25 years. I didn't know where the Senate parliamentarian's office is. But they did. And they ransacked the office looking for the electoral college boxes. And but for two quick-thinking young staffers on the floor that day who took the box with them, they would have gotten the box. That's the reality Joe Biden walked into. And then later that day, when they're trying to certify the results of the elections, he still had scores of Republicans vote against recognizing him as president. And to this day, there are leaders in the Republican Party who won't say he was elected. They'll say he's president, but not that he's elected because there's a fiction he stole the election. That makes it very hard in Joe Biden's case to come in with that, not that he has anger, because he doesn't, but the atmosphere around him to say, I'm going to put aside everything, the issues that my folks care about, and try to reach out to these folks who won't even say that I won the election fair and square. I'll go back to being restrained. Um, let me just, uh, I'm going to let Peter Calico say something quickly, oh. and then we'll do the last question, OK? I just Thank want you. to bring up a point. When people ask me the definition of democracy, I give them a simple definition. The peaceful transfer of power after an election. We didn't have that. The existing president, who was my friend, I have to be honest with you about it, either had no knowledge of American history or no knowledge of the facts and tried to change the way we govern our country. Wait. The great thing about America is it didn't happen. It may have been the staffers. It may not have been. But it didn't happen because nobody wanted it to happen other than those people who were there trying to make mischief. So we live in a great country, and I hope you will understand that. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. OK, last question. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you guys here and to be able to ask you a question. Solving uh, the issue of coronavirus was one of Joe Biden's campaign promises. Yet, I mean, we're still in almost the same spot we were months ago before he took office. How do you think? he can improve on this? And do you think that we're ever going to get back to normal? I th uh, yes, I, th I think we'll get back to normal. I, I think this is, you just asked a fascinating question, which is a tough one is the last question to ask because there's so <laughs> many layers, layers to this. Um, this is an example of, of a joint effort in a lot of different ways. Uh, the Moderna folks, the Pfizer folks, the J&J &J folks all did a great job in accelerating their processes to get vaccines. I give the Trump administration credit for putting money into it. Not so much for Operation Warp Speed. I, don't, I think that probably confused things more than anything else. But, did it, but 
but they really put an emphasis on getting the vaccine. I don't think they did as good a job in getting it off the ground. I think the president sent mixed messages about it. I think he could have done more. I think the Biden administration did a very good job of, um, of getting distribution, of putting something sound in place um, to, to reduce the numbers. And I'm just so struck when I think back over the last year, because when we got to early July, it looked like we actually had gotten to where we needed to go. Cases were down to 10,000 cases a day. And um, even though there were pockets in the country, I, I'll give you an example. Where, where I, uh, in July, August, um, where I live in New Mexico, in a place like Los Alamos County, which is uh, by census numbers, the most educated county in the country, their vaccination rate was in the mid 80s. But we had counties in New Mexico with vaccination rates in the low 30s. Same state, right? And that just created the opportunity for Delta uh, to spread. And I think the Biden administration maybe thought they had really gotten to the place where this was gonna be okay. This gets really hard and, and Ari is probably, uh, has more insights in this than, than I would, but it's really, I, I mentioned before, getting inside somebody else's head. This is getting inside people's head who don't wanna get the vaccine, who don't wanna wear a mask, to make it clear this isn't a political fight, that this is not some conspiracy that some drug company is doing so they can make a lot of money. Vaccines work, masks work, those are just sensible public health policy. So I think the thing he could do is just try to be repetitive over and over again that these are sound steps that should be taken. They're not political steps. It's not a statement if you're not wearing a mask. It's not a political statement if you wear a mask. It's just good public health. Yeah, I think the biggest mistake Joe Biden made was during the campaign when he said, I'm not going to shut down the economy. I'm going to shut down the virus. He never should have said that. You can't shut it down. No one is going to shut down this virus. This is now an epidemic. This is going to come back every year, just like the flu and just like other things do. The flu is deadly, especially for people who are older, especially for people who have other conditions. Same thing now with the virus. And I'm vaccinated. If, I get a, if the booster comes my way, if I'm allowed to take it, I'm taking that booster. And I say it regularly on Fox. If people choose not to, they're making a mistake. They're playing Russian roulette with their lives. But you know what? We all need to stop worrying about this. If they want to put themselves in the hospital, I'm not going to stop them. That's their foolishness. But politicians need to just help move our nation beyond it. And, and frankly, I'm not convinced that everybody needs to wear a mask everywhere. I mean, honestly, why do we sitting here not wear masks and you sitting there yeah, do? And I, uh, I mean, so many of these rules just boggle my mind about defying common sense. Why, when I walk into a restaurant, do I have to wear a mask when I'm walking around, but I sit down and I don't? Why do the waiters and waitresses always have to? You know, I don't know that that is science-based anymore. I think now it's become just, we have to do something, so this is what we do. The vaccine is where the science is at. I think everything else is a healthy reminder to mankind that something, sometimes nature and science are smarter than all of us, and we don't know all the answers. So we just have to put one foot in front of the other, live our best lives, do what we can do, and not make this the political issue that defines us. Good. Thank you. I appreciate both of your uh, responses. Please join me in thanking our speakers for a very spirited discussion of some difficult topics. I should say also that the only reason we're not wearing masks here is so that we can address the audience comfortably. But um, Hofstra is 100% vaccinated and we wear masks as soon as we step off the stage. Please join me in thanking our speakers for a wonderful event. We'll continue the conversation on their next visit. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Peter.